let's start the class chapter eight now what is chapter what is uh, chapter eight? chapter eight is talking about audit evidence right so what do we mean by audit uh, audit evidence now audit evidence is covered under uh isc 500 right that is the relevant uh, auditing standard international standard auditing number number 500 is, is the uh standard for audit evidence so what is audit evidence now, for those that are just joining us, remember last class, I said that we have the audit engagement circle, right? When we have the planning of the audit, which is the first step. We now go on to guarding of audit evidence. We now go on to evaluation and review of audit evidence before we now go on to uh, reporting. So we have done planning last class. So we are moving on to audit evidence, which is like gathering audit evidence. Now in this chapter, we're looking at audit evidence extensively, in fact, uh, uh, let me let me uh, bust your bubble. This chapter eight is the most voluminous aspect of your syllabus or the ICANN study text itself. Okay, the largest part, the largest aspect of your study text is contained in this chapter, chapter eight. So we're looking at audit evidence extensively. So what is audit evidence according to ISS 500? Is any information used by the auditor to arrive at an opinion on which the report is based? So any information, both information he gathered and the one he, he obtained from other independent sources, right? Combination of them, uh, um, documented, right? Online, uh, soft copy, hard copy, any information that he obtained, particularly regarding that engagement, right? Is known as what? Audit evidence, okay? Now, audit evidence, Destroying his conclusion, which is the solid opinion about the engagement that he is currently uh, working on. Now, before you go on on audit evidence, also need to, to be sure that the auditor is going to gather sufficient and appropriate audit evidence, right? He must carry out two tests, and the tests are test of controls and test of detailed transaction, right? Now, what's test of control, the test of detailed transaction? Now, before now, you you have head of compliance testing and substantive testing. Now, as we speak now, both compliance testing and substantive testing are no longer in use. They are archaic, right? So if you are writing audit examination and using compliance or substantive testing, that means you are living in the past. You are living in the stone age. So the new name for these two tests are test of controls and test of detailed transaction. Now, what I will do by test of control? Test of control are those control or are those tests on those internal control systems in the client business environment to check whether it is efficient and is effective. That is test of control. Why the test of uh, detailed transaction is a follow-up to test of control. So if you are not convinced, okay, if your uh Reasonable assurance is low. If you don't have enough reasonable assurance about the test of control, right, you proceed to conducting test of detailed transaction. So this transaction is a test on the. Are you pointing? So just mute your just mute your mic, right? Just mute our mic, please. Okay, thank you. Everybody should move your move their mic. Okay, so the uh, to to reassure or for assurance that the internal control system is efficient. Okay, so you now proceed to um, evaluating by looking taking samples from the uh transactions taking samples from the financial statements and try to reconcile or confirm that those transactions can be uh tied to what you have in the financial statement so when you do that one that is what we know as a test of detailed transaction that means you are trying to vouch those transactions as to what you have in the financial statement okay so that's what we mean by the uh, so test of detailed transaction. So after the auditor has convinced himself or herself that 
he has uh, the internal control system is efficient, then he will go ahead to obtain audit evidence. Okay. Now, I also need to understand with audit evidence is that in the the two characteristics that audit evidence have, they are uh, sufficiency and appropriateness. Okay. They are sufficiency and what appropriateness. What do we mean by sufficiency? What do we mean by appropriateness? Now, sufficiency has to do with the quantity of information available. All right. It has to do with what quantity of information available. All right. To the to the auditor, the, the uh, amount of information the auditor can obtain as relates to um, the uh, engagement. Okay. We talk about the um, sufficiency. Why appropriateness has to do with the uh, the quality of the information gathered or obtained. Okay. And, and because you are looking at the quality of relates to that particular engagement. So we need to ensure that you gather only relevant uh, audit evidence, okay? Then the reliability is looking at the source of those audit evidence that you are gathering, because it's very key, very important that the source is credible and is reliable, all right? Because if, the, if it's not uh, credible and reliable, then that means that whatever opinion the auditor is going to form will be considered as a uh, full of what? Incorrect opinion and to lead to audit risk. All right. So, for the auditor to be sure that he's able to obtain sufficient and appropriate evidence, right, he must, he must carry out those two tests test of controls and test of business transaction. Then, once that has been done, it's now going to uh, proceed to the next level. Now, one of the things you need to understand when talking about reliability of audit evidence is that for the auditor, it's very, very sacrosanct that the audit evidence that is going to rely on, right, should be something that has a, a high level of what reliability, that it must be sure of the source of that information, and that information must be correct, okay? And that leads us to the uh, generalizations, okay? That is, for the auditor to be able to uh, place reliability on audit evidence, then he needs to ensure that uh, the following uh, generalizations are met, okay? The following generalizations are what are met. What are the generalizations? Number one, audit evidence is more reliable when it's obtained from independent source or sources outside the entities under audit. And the reason is understandable. Now, for information that you get from within the entity, sometimes can be some form of controlled information, all right? controlled information. They might not give you everything that you require because there's an obligation, okay? Now, but when you are dealing with an independent source that doesn't have any obligation to the client, you are very sure of the level of uh, information in terms of sincerity and reliability of the information they are going to get from that independent source or from that independent sources, especially if it's coming from a knowledgeable uh, independent source or sources, okay? Another thing you also need to know, another generalization for audit evidence is that audit evidence that is generated internally is more reliable, okay, when the related controls are effective. So that financial reporting is effective, right? Then that means that the uh, audit evidence that is obtained internally can be or will be more reliable, all right? The number three, you also said that audit evidence obtained by the auditor himself, all right, is more reliable than audit evidence obtained indirectly, okay? Audit, audit evidence obtained indirectly or audit evidence obtained indirectly or audit evidence uh, that is obtained by inference, right? So what we are saying here is that the auditor that is gathering the audit evidence, he knows what he wants, okay? He knows his audience, 
and that is why he is very sure of what he's getting or is gathering. And that means that any other information he gets indirectly or by inference, inference means assumption, right, might not be as reliable as the one that he gathered uh, himself. Then we also need to understand that uh, audit evidence that is obtained in a documentary form is more reliable than audit evidence obtained in an oral form. Why? Because the reason is not far-fetched. When evidence is obtained in an oral form, it can be denied, okay? It becomes your word against theirs, okay? But if it's obtained in documentary form, it can hardly be what be denied because you have a documentary evidence to back whatever that person has said, okay? Then the lastly, all the evidence obtained in original copies are more reliable than all the evidence obtained in photocopies or fax me. What that means is that when you make use of original document, it tends to be more reliable because photocopy can be adulterated, okay? Can be an instrument used to perpetuate fraud. I see instances where a voucher that has been passed and payment that has been made was resubmitted again in photocopy, okay? Even though for the fact that I was very observant and I was I have eye for details, I was, I was able to spot it. I immediately I spotted it. I had to call for uh, an inquiry into why the staff represented that uh, document, okay? For another the same payment, okay? So that's what, so with all of these, these are what you use to substantiate the reliability of what audit evidence, the five uh, generalizations that I just explained now. All right. Uh, okay. And next we look at, right, we look at the methods of obtaining audit evidence. There are about seven methods of obtaining audit evidence. So let's look at them one after the others. Okay. Now, what you need to understand is that this method, they are not mutually exclusive. You can combine more than one method. It doesn't mean that you must use one in a particular situation. You can combine them as you like, all right? Provided you're able to have uh, a, uh, a reliable uh, audit evidence at the end of the day. So in no particular, that we start with the first one. The first one is inspection. Inspection means looking at items such as tangible assets, documents, entries of account records, okay? Inspection means you are taking a look at assets, okay? Document. Assets, you are trying to check that those assets actually exist and the status of those assets. For documents, you are also trying to verify that the document that you are examining is authentic, is original, all right? And also expecting that the postings into the uh, system, the accounting records that are posted into the system are also correct, that's inspection. The observation is, watching um, another person perform an, uh, perform an activity with the hope of trying to uh, confirm, okay, the performance of that activity, okay? So somebody is doing something, right? You are now there to observe how those things are done, all right? So in the essence is that you are trying to establish that actually that particular um activity was recorded and uh performed okay so an example of that is when the externators watch uh as a physical inventory count is being conducted okay so that's an example of observation then inquiry means seeking information from knowledgeable persons instead of outside the entity okay so you're making an inquiry, you're asking questions as to for people that are knowledgeable, that have understanding of what you are asking, be able to throw more light on why transaction transactions occur. All right, so that you don't need to do that, you don't just raise unnecessary queries. Okay, so once you have that understanding, you'll be able to you able to appreciate the work of the management concerning the preparation of the financial statements. Okay, then we also have external confirmation. This is where the auditor places reliance on the work done by uh, third parties, especially knowledgeable third parties, okay? So for instance, our auditors are not trained to carry out the work for uh, architect, engineers, surveyors, and the likes. So these people, the auditors rely on their work. They place reliance on their work. And because they place reliance on their work, right, there is a need for 
them to take some level of responsibility, knowing fully well that those people are people that they know for their professionalism and not because they know them for friendship. They know them because of their professionalism, level of professionalism, so that they can place reliance on them. The base, the big risk for auditors to place reliance on the work of third party or knowledgeable third party is the fact that it's going to take ownership of that engagement as though he understood he, ca- he was the one that carried out the activity itself. Okay, so that's what we mean. Then uh, we have a recalculation. The recalculation is another method of obtaining audit evidence like cross casting, okay, and checking the mechanical accuracy of transactions or records, okay, that you have on the system. You know, sometimes when you export uh, some of these financial data from the accounting packages and ERP or accounting system, sometimes the formula we omit a rule or an item. So as auditors, you need to confirm all those uh, subtotals, grand totals, to be sure that no item is left uh, out, okay, of that uh, addition. Then we also have uh, re, uh, re-performance. Re-performance is an independent uh, execution, okay, of procedure or control by an auditor, okay? So somebody has already done, somebody has already by, evaluated the, the internal control. So the auditor now said, let him do it himself. Let him be sure that that person did not play a fast one on him, okay? And because of that, you need to do it himself to be sure that they are going to arrive at the same uh, conclusion. So an example of this performance is known as what? Work through testing, okay? Work through testing. Well, that's an example of performance. Then we have the uh, last one, which is the article review procedures. And this one shows possible relationship between financial and non-financial data. This one shows related relationship, okay? Between financial and non-financial data. And it includes uh, different types. There's one we call trend analysis. It's a type of analytical review procedure. Uh, ratios is another type of analytical review procedures. The net changes is another type of analytical review procedures. So as an auditor, when trying to obtain audit evidence, you can use any of this method to obtain audit evidence, okay? I hope that is clear. Does anybody have any question? Does anybody have any question before we proceed? Yeah. Hi, Mr. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, oh, sorry. I think no problem. Go ahead. Don't worry. Just go ahead. So, um, I was... I'm with you. I didn't get you. Like they, look, they look kind of similar. Which one? Can you hear me? Yes, you said what? Recalculation, recalculation and reperformance. No. Recalculation is talking about... Mechanical accuracy, that's the, the addition and summation. That's what you do in recalculation. While the performance is trying to carry out, to perform, trying to perform an audit, a process or a procedure with the intention of having a better understanding whether there are gaps in that system or not. Okay. Is that clear? Are you convinced yeah. now? Yeah, it's clear. It's just because of the example I saw under the performance. I mean, the aging analysis for like year and trade receivables. Mm-hmm. You know, that's still it's still like an estimation, like a calculation. Now, so, what you are doing? So, okay, now to you to even use that example that you said. Now, if the uh the client has extracted the aging analysis from the system for the auditor. Okay, what that means is that the auditor will now go to the system himself or herself to generate that same report and see whether it's going to arrive at the same conclusion. So if he goes to the system to extract that same information, what he's doing is known as what re performance and not recalculation. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's that. Thank you. Any other question? You're welcome. Any other question from anybody? Any other question, comments? All right, so we go to the next one, which is the financial statement assertion. Now, 
This is a new one, okay, in the syllabus. What do we mean by financial assessment assertion? Now, financial assessment assertion, right, they are statements made by management to the auditors that the financial statement that they prepare and present to the auditor do not contain any material misstatement. I take the gate. Financial assessment assertions are statements, categorical statements made by management to the auditors that the financial statement they present, they prepared and present to the auditors are free of material misstatements. Okay, what that implies is that after they prepared financial statement, they have to present it to the auditor. When they present, present it to the auditor, the auditor will ask, how am I sure that there are no material misstatements in this financial statement? And look at what I use. I chose my word carefully. Are there no material misstatements in this financial statement? Now, what you need to understand is that in every financial statement, you can have misstatements. Misstatements are allowable, but material misstatements are not. Okay, so that's what we ask. Are there any material misstatements? If they said no, then they are going to, the other way, ask them, how do you mean? They will now give their assertion. So, what the other we need to do is to test those assertions, whether those assertions actually uh, they are true or false, all right? So there are three types of assertions, or the three types of financial assertion. We have assertion based on transactions and events that relates to information that is contained in the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensible income, all right? We have the assertion based on account balances that relates to information that is contained in the statement of financial position. Then we have assertion based on presentation and disclosure, okay? That relates to both the statement of financial uh, statement of financial position and statement of profit or loss and other comprehensible income. Why did I say so? Now, if you go back to your um, IS one, okay, talking about the uh, presentation of the financial statement, right? We said that there are different formats that you use to prepare financial statements. So if you don't if you don't present the financial statement in that particular format. It will not be acceptable by the auditor. That will mean by assertion based on presentation and disclosure. Then, for every of these financials, whether the statement of financial position or statement of profit or loss, there must be some element of what disclosures for easy understandability of the users of that financial information. Because without those notes to the account, which we know as disclosures, it will be very difficult for an ordinary person to have an understanding of what the uh, financial statement, uh, how to read or interpret the information contained in the financial statement, okay? So we are starting with the first one, which is a assertion based on transactions and events, okay? Now, in that, we are going to, we are going to test this, uh, this assertion. Number one is completeness. What do we mean by completeness? <clears throat> What do, you mean, what do you mean by completeness? Now, completeness has to do with uh, the auditor trying to test whether all recorded transactions, okay, events, uh, assets, liability, everything, okay, that should have been recorded have already been recorded, okay? That is every information that relates to assets, liabilities, equity, interest, trans transactions, and events that ought to have been recorded have been recorded. That is, you do not leave anything out. And as I take a cue from the um, IA 16, okay, that talks about property plans and equipment, okay, and it says that an asset can be put to use, okay, I, 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 no, not even looking at put to use, that every cost. As it is entered to putting an asset to use must be considered, okay, when they try to uh, when they try to uh, determine the total cost of that asset. That is all the cost is entered to that asset to put it into use should be considered when trying to determine the total cost of the asset. So what that means is that you should not only rely on the invoice value or fair value. You need to talk of, of uh, cost of commission or the commission, cost of service, okay, Cost of the transportation, delivery, all of this should be factored in. Okay. So, so at the end of the day, you are going to, so if they have omitted any of those costs, let's say they omitted transportation costs and the commission costs, 
that means that the information they put there is incomplete. That means there are some transactions that they have not recorded and they ought to have recorded them because it is not in line with IAS 16 that talks about property, plant, and equipment. Okay, I hope that is clear. Then go to the next one, occurrence, all right? Occurrence here means transactions, event recorded in the financial statement took place during the accounting period and released to that entity. So you should ensure that if you are preparing financial statement of year 2023, all the transactions that are contained in that financial statement relates to year 2023 and not to 2024 or 2021, okay? You must relate to 2023. Then another one is the accuracy. Accuracy is looking at ensuring that proper amount have been disclosed in the financial statement. Later we test the information, whether proper lab amount has been disclosed, okay, in the financial statement. We're going to do the addition and uh, the submission, okay? Then we have uh, classification and uh, understandability. Now, this is this. So what you have here now, okay? What you have here is a combination of all the assertions, okay, that they we test. They did not split it into three, okay? It's all the assertions that the auditor we test. So I need to make that correction. So all the, one, the ones I've talked about, the completeness, occurrence, accuracy, classification, right? Those ones relate basically to the assertion based on transactions and events, okay? So the classification and understandability, that itself, classification and accountability relates to assertion based on disclosure and presentation or presentation and disclosure, whichever way you put it, you are not, you will be, you will not be penalized, okay? So what that means is that for all the information that is uh, contained in financial statement have been appropriately presented and all necessary disclosures have been, what, have been made uh, clear because we are looking at presentation and disclosure. Whether you talk about uh, classification and understandability. But classification itself alone, if without your understandability relates to assertion based on transactions and events. Then we have valuation and allocation. Valuation and allocation also relates to uh relates to um assertion based on account balances. Okay. It relates to assertion based on what account balances. So you are looking at uh if there are any amounts resulting from uh impairment okay that whether those uh, information or those amount those adjustments have been properly uh, recorded okay and disclosed in the financial statement okay that's what we mean by valuation allocation that means you must carry out impairment tests and if you notice or if there are any differences or variances you must ensure that uh, proper disclosures are made as regarding this then another example, another type of uh, assertion based on uh, account balances is also existence. So later we go and test what assets, liabilities, and equity interest exists, okay? When they are doing uh, asset verification, that's one of the things they go and do, to go and test uh, the existence of those assets. Then we have cut off. Cut off is to assertion based on transactions and events, okay? And ensures that only transactions for that current period are recorded. For instance, if you incur expense for 2022, it should be recorded in 2022 and not to be recorded in 2023, regardless of the time, okay? So for instance, let's say it was uh, was recorded, uh, or the transaction occurred uh, 31st December 2023 at about 11.59. So because it's not 12 a.m. that we go to a new year, that transaction was recorded in year 2023. That's what we are trying to say. All right. The classification itself, you know, that I talked about, that relates to a uh, session based on uh, uh, transactions and events, okay, to be sure that the transactions have been posted into the right account X, okay? So that's the analysis of the financial statement assertion. I hope that is clear, all right? Then we now have the uh, another subtopic where we talk about directional testing. What this entails, what this entail itself is that we talk about uh, errors, okay, in financial statement. 
there are always two sides to an error. That is, if you detect an error on the debit side, if you look closely, you are going to discover the second leg of that error on the debit side. Okay, if you discover it on the credit side, the second leg will be on the debit side. And that is what gives rise to directional testing. That is, we are ensuring that for every uh, error, okay, within the organization, there's a corresponding entry on the other side, okay? So what are the advantages of this? It helps the editor to clarify the audit objectives, all right? Number two, it focuses the audit work on areas of high audit risk, okay? It links um, together the results of audit tests, okay? Like I said, look at what they said about uh, National test that is the foundation of the fundamental principle of double entry accounting, where for every debit entry there is a corresponding debit entry. Okay, so like example, they, are, they say if a non credit asset are overstated by five million, but if you have balance uh, balances, then one of the errors must have happened. Okay, to explain how the situation has a uh, as a reason. Okay, so. Sorry. So that is that about um, about that. Okay. All these are other examples on uh, the um, what we talk about the. Sorry. What we talk about the directional testing. Okay. It's part of all these are examples. That they, uh, they, that they use to explain what this, uh, what is, uh, all right? Now, okay, so that is that. I'm still looking at other information here. So that's that about, uh, uh, financial statement assertion. So later we test all of those, each of those assertions one after the other to be sure that it contains the right words, the right information. Okay. And that takes us to audit documentation. What do you mean by audit documentation? Audit documentation is the same thing as audit working paper and it's contained in ISC 3, I mean 230. All right. 230. Right. So what that means is that any, uh, it relates to any information. Okay that the auditor has gathered, okay, that we assist in the drawing up of conclusion about a particular engagement, okay? So that's what we mean by audit uh, documentation, audit working paper, all right? So the audit documentation provides a record of the audit procedures performed, okay? As the audit procedures that they have performed, then audit evidence obtained and conclusions uh, reached in that order, all right? So I, ISA 20, uh, 230, right, requires the auditor to prepare documentation on a timely basis, okay, for sufficient uh, and for sufficient or to promote sufficiency and enable an experienced auditor with no previous connection with the audit to be able to understand, okay? That means you must, we are trying to compile your audit documentation. You should do it in such a way that a novice may take in a look at your documentation. We have an understanding of what activity that you just, uh, you've just performed, all right? So that's what we mean by audit uh, documentation, all right? Now, what are the reasons for preparing sufficient and appropriate audit evidence? or audit documentation, sorry. One of the reasons is that it enhances the quality of the audit because if somebody wants to uh, show that he has done something, there must be evidence or proof of what he has done. And that is an example of quality of the audit, okay? It facilitates effective review and evaluation of the audit evidence obtained, okay? And conclusion switch before the audit report is finished, is finished, finalized. What that means is that if you look at the uh, audit evidence itself, right, 
you will see that it plays an important role in the opinion that the editor uh, generates or arrives at at the end of the engagement. They also assist the audit team to plan and perform the audit. Okay, it also assists supervisors in directing and supervising audit work. All right, because you have a manual, you have a document that you can that, that serve as a guide for you. Okay, ensuring members of audit team are accountable to their work because at the end of the day, your work will speak for you. All right, the work will do what we speak for the auditor. All right. Now, audit documentation also you need to understand that it might be on paper, it might be on a soft copy, right? But the documentation for a specific engagement is assembled in an audit file. So the precise content of the audit working paper varies depending on the nature and type and size of the client. Okay, and the complexity of the audit processes required to reach the what the conclusion. So what we are seeing here is that. For every audit documentation, there are two files that are contained in the audit documentation. We have the permanent file, permanent audit file. We have the current audit file. What do you mean by permanent audit file? Permanent audit file contains information that, uh, uh, that may be used for more than one audit, okay? One audit period. So you're going to use it for several times, not once, okay? Because they don't, they are not expected to change. The information contained therein are not as well to change, okay? Examples, okay, of information that you have there is the constitution of the company. When you talk about constitution of the company, you are talking about the articles and memorandum of association. These are the constitution of the company, right? Then you have other important legal documents, such as loan agreement. It's also uh, something that has happened in the past. It cannot be adjusted. Then in summary of history, development and ownership of the business, it can also not change historical perspective of the business, okay? For instance, uh, if a business starts in a town, even if it leaves Nigeria and goes onshore, it will still relate to where, how it started the business, okay? So that means the history is not expected to want to change. The record of the accounting system and procedures used by the client, so that one too also takes time before it changes, okay? So if there are, account, there are records, okay, by the accounting system, so the editor might also, uh, the policy, all this accounting policy, right? They are contained, and accounting policies, right? They are contained in a, in a file, which, the audit, which is normally presented to the auditor, and they are not expected to change in a long while. So the editor can rely on that accounting policy and procedure to un gain an understanding of how the financial statements have been, what have been prepared, okay? The copies of previous finance, audited financial statement of years, years ago, we also not expected to change. So they will form part of the information that are contained in the permanent uh, audit file. All right. In the case of the current audit file, it's opposite of what happens in the permanent audit file. The current audit file contains information that are used in the current year's audit. Okay. It contains information that are used in the current year's audit. All right. So the information that you have there, you have the final financial statement and auditor's report. That is the draft uh, financial statement and auditor's report will be there. Then the summary of audit adjustment, including those not included. Are we together? Is there a question? Yes. Okay, please go ahead. No, go ahead, please. No, no, no. no. Not at all. I was answering your question. Um, if you asked if we were together. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. So I was talking about the current audit file. I say it contains information that are uh, relevant for the current years. Auditor's report for that current year. The summary of audit adjustment. Okay, including those not included in the final reported. Uh, figures. Then the audit planning documentation, okay, audit control material like the time budget, review points, okay, all those will also be contained therein. And also, letter of engagement, because letters of engagement are supposed to be reviewed every year, okay? Letter of engagement ought to be reviewed every year, all right? So it will form part of the information 
that is contained in the current uh, audit file, all right? Then the audit plan also will be included in the current audit file because for each year, you draw up a new plan. You don't use the uh, last year's plan, okay? You draw up a new uh, audit plan. Now, uh, so those are the two types of audit documentation that you have, the current audit file and the current audit file, all right? So what you also need to understand here is for every audit working paper or audit documentation, it must contain the following. Number one, it will contain the name of the client. That means it must have a title, okay? It must have an accounting date, that is the year, the period that you are auditing. It must have a file reference, right? The name of the persons preparing the working paper must also be there. The date the paper was prepared must also be there. The name of the person reviewing So we're discussing the uh, audit documentation before the uh, the network breach, right? We just finished explaining the audit documentation. I was trying to talk about the an audit uh, audit documentation. It has it must that means every audit documentation or audit working paper must have the name of the client. Okay, the accounting date, that is the year that they're auditing. Or is it the audit in 2023? You must have the period or year in 2023. Then you must have a file reference, okay? The name of the persons preparing the working paper must also be there. The date the paper was prepared must be there. The name of any person reviewing the work or the extent of such review must also be there. The date of the review must be there. Okay, a key to explanation of the audit ticks or symbols used in the audit working paper should also be there. So what that means is that there are certain, uh, we call it audit tick marks, okay? So for instance, if the auditor is trying to compare uh, information from different uh, sources, okay? Okay, you might need to use a symbol or a uh, an alphabet or combination of alphabet to represent or to depict that that information has already been confirmed, okay? So I will not do a repeat, you will not repeat such um, uh, activity again, okay? Because you have it will show that that has already been done by the auditor. That's what we mean by the, those tick marks, all right? A list of any error or omission identified and the auditor's conclusion on the area will also be there, okay? So what that means is that for auditor, right, you must ensure that the audit working paper or the audit uh, documentation is ready, okay, at least 60 days, okay? It must be ready 60 days after the audit report is what is published. That is, what we are saying is that after you have published the audit report, you have 60 days to compile your audit working paper as what? as document, okay? You have 60 days, okay? The auditor must not delete or discard all your documentation before the end of its retention period. So all the way back should not be deleted because it has uh, uh, its own importance, okay? There might be a need for it. You're able to, I mean, you must be able to retrieve such information, okay? Then we also have uh, the audit document now that has now become digitized or become electronic, okay? And what that means is that auditors use computer softwares now, okay, to improve the efficiency of preparing audit working paper. So, uh, and that has a lot of uh, advantages, okay? And one of the advantages it potent is that audit working paper now are neat. There's no need for you to cancel or to use TPEX or to use a, a eraser, okay? You don't need that again because it's on the system. You can easily... Uh, correct it or make necessary adjustments. So it's very neat, okay? And it's easy to read and in a standard format. There is a lower risk of error by the auditor in processing adjustments, okay? Lower risk of error. So that means that there might not be errors, okay? In the uh, compilation of that uh, audit uh, working paper. The number three, 
the audit review process by senior management or this audit partner can be carried out remotely. So you don't need to be there. For before now, before the became electronic, you have to be there. But well, this can be done remotely now, okay? Without necessarily being there. Number four, another advantage is that the automatic presentation and the automatic processing of adjustment by the auditor using softwares may result in significant savings of time. So all those adjustments can be uh, computerized, okay? Just by using some uh, SQL, okay, or some other software to carry out uh, this, uh, this adjustment, okay? So those are the advantages of the introduction of computer generated audit working papers, okay? Then we'll now look at who, now let me ask a question. Who do you think owns the audit working paper? Who owns the audit working paper? Okay, so you need to, that's a rhetorical question. Okay, you can, you can answer it by yourself, by yourself, okay? Answer it by yourself, okay? Wherever you are. Now, who owns the audit working paper? The audit working paper belongs to the audit firm, all right? So when a new engagement is, uh, when a new uh, audit firm takes over, sometimes they will need to hand over it to them to be able to have an understanding of what they have done before, to know where to start from, okay? So that's what you need to uh, need to uh, understand. So the auditor should not withhold, uh, should not uh, withhold any document that relates to the client, especially when he knows that he has, he has some outstanding uh, payment or this fee to be made, to be made. You shouldn't hold on to that because the court has ruled that you don't hold on to any document that requires, uh, that belongs to the client. Then also, why we audit working paper, right, must be uh, kept for a minimum of what? Five years, okay? So that is, uh, that about that. They will now go to ISC. So that's that about all the documentation. So we have other areas to consider. Does anybody have any question before we proceed? Any question, any comment, any observation before we proceed? Are there questions, observations before we proceed? If there are no questions, no observation, we can proceed to... Oh. We can proceed to other considerations like the... Sir. Um, yes, I'm with you. Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Can hear you. So, um, I just want to confirm the yes. um the handing over of the working paper to um the new auditor. Yes. In case that that happens, is it both mm -hmm. the um permanent audit file and the current audit file? Like, I just want to know. Uh, yes, everything. Else. Both of them, everything okay. that's that, or if it's about the permanent audit file and the current audit file will be handed over to the new audit firm. Okay, it's not that they are going to own it, it's just for them to have a review of it. Okay, they can make copies when they want, wherever they want, okay, to create their own file. But they need to uh, start from somewhere, all right, because when you are starting an engagement, you need to rely on information, except uh, unless if you are the first for that particular engagement. That okay. might not be necessary. Yes, but once you are taking over annual or taking over from someone, you must ensure that you collect, it's even, it's even standard that you collect the audit the working paper from the previous uh, client. That's why you always say that there must be uh, some form of uh, clearance, which we call professional inquiry between the old audit firm and the new audit firm. So if there is no such communication, if there is no smooth transition from old to new, it will not happen. But when there is a smooth transition from old to new, definitely it's going to be seamless. All right? Oh, I'll be able to answer your question. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, so I get okay. that. But um, are there no risk attached to like handing over the, the audit file? Because like I'm just wondering, if mm. upon handing over the file to the new mm. auditor and mm. um and those I, I mean and the new auditor reviews it and maybe they um notice um um something that errors. Was like yeah errors or maybe errors a or, or omission. anything 
Yeah. Mm. Could it be a threat? Could it pose a, a threat or a risk to the previous auditor? No, no, no. It's not. It's not a threat. The essence of this is that, you know, as part of quality control, right? Nobody is perfect, right? So if they notice that uh, issue of error or maybe uh, a missing information, is a pointer to the new auditor correcting those so that it will not repeat itself in the future. It's for the betterment of both audit firms. Okay, okay, that's, mm. that's okay then. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right. So we look at another aspect, which is the, uh, what we call the um, related parties, okay, and related party transactions. So we already look at this. This is already contained in your, uh, in your CR, all right? You have it in CR, but we are concerned with what we have in audit. So ISA 550 looks at related party transactions. Now, related party transactions and related party, the essential information you need to note here is that he's saying that for every related party and related party transactions, there is need for proper disclosures to be made. So what that means, what do you mean by related party? What we, what we mean by related party is that these are individuals organizations that might have or said to have some undue influence on the company that is being audited. So their presence alone can uh, destabilize or influence the decision of the management, okay? So uh, because of that, you always expect that there's always the need to disclose any related party transactions, okay? For instance, the directors and the key management of a company and their family, other, com other companies controlled by the directors, key managers and members of their close family and other companies in the group. All these are what we call known as related parties, okay? Now, the responsibility of the client company's management is to record and disclose all material related party transactions because these transactions may be carried out on more favorable terms than similar transactions with an independent third party. What that means is that because there is those who that exercise undue influence, there is every need that uh, transactions are not carried out at an arm's length transaction. That is, if transactions are carried out in form of a connected person, that is, because I know this person, the person did not pay the full amount. He was giving some discount, okay? Or he was giving some preference, okay, for certain information. So that's what we mean. So what we are saying here is that there is need for every organization to always disclose their uh, related party and related party transactions in their notes to the account as relates to the financial uh, statements, okay? Now, the objective of the auditor with regards to ISA 550 are uh, to one, to gain an understanding of the entity's related party relationship and transaction, which is the main thing. Uh, number two, to recognize fraud, risk, fraud and risk factor arising from related party relationship and transaction, because they can use that as a means to perpetrate fraud. Then conclude the financial statement, achieve fair presentation, okay, in respect of related party relationship and tra transactions. So they must ensure that there is a adequate information, okay? They did, not, they did not hide any information from other users of financial information, okay? So ISF requires auditor to perform risk assessment procedures in order to understand the entities related party relationship and transactions. So the procedures are as follows, okay? So to carry out uh, risk assessment, right, you will need to consider the risk of material misstatement due to fraud or error arising from related parties and relationship, okay? So you will to uh, inquiries into the entity's relationship and nature of transactions with related party. You need to identify the accounting for a disclosure of related party transactions, okay? And the authorization and approval of significant related party transactions and the authorization and approval of significant transactions outside the normal course of business. Okay, we need to identify related parties and related party transactions as well. All right, 
So in making inquiries of management in respect of the entity of related parties, the director will obtain a list of related parties from the directors and consider if the list is complete. So the test for completeness would include the following. So they will need to, what happened here is that at every organization, the management must present uh, and disclose their list of related party transactions and related party itself, okay? And the editor will review the working paper of previous year to look for names or known related parties, okay? We also review the company's procedure for identifying related parties. It's also going, it's also going and the entity. They also need to review shareholders' record for the names of major shareholders. Then we need to review minutes of shareholders' meeting. Okay? And also, we need to ask other audit firms involved in the audit about related party or ask previous auditors of the company about the knowledge of related party. The only sense is to ensure that uh, full disclosures are made, okay, in the financial statements, okay? Full disclosures are made in the what? In the financial uh, statements, okay? So that's what you need to know about uh, related party transaction. Okay? Now, what are the uh, what of if there are what are the responses to risk of material misstatement, okay, as relates to I say 550, which is the related party transaction. So it requires the following audit procedure. So if the editor discovers previously unidentified or undisclosed related party, right? So what are the things he needs to do? He must determine whether the underlying circumstances confirm the existence of this relationship or transactions. Number two, he must communicate the relevant information to the audit team. All right, every member of the audit engagement team must be aware. They need to request management to identify all transactions with newly identified related parties. All right, they inquire as to why the entity system failed to identify or disclose these related party relationship and transactions. Then perform appropriate substantive procedures on the newly identified related parties transactions. Then we consider the risk of it's going to be unidentified, undisclosed related parties or significant related party transactions and perform additional audit procedure as necessary. So what you're saying is that there's a risk that you still have more unidentified or undisclosed related party. All of these will be there, all right? And that takes us to um, another one that we're going to look at which is uh, ISA 450, which talks about ev evaluation of misstatement, okay? Now, what do we mean by this? Now, what we mean is that in the course of uh, preparing the financial, uh, reviewing or examining the financial statement, the little might stumble on misstatements. What are those things that are considered as misstatements, okay? So let's look at it, okay? Now, uh, you said evaluation of misstatement and if I doing the audit requires the auditor to consider both the size and nature of the misstatement, okay? So the particular circumstance of this occurrence when evaluating whether a, a, a misstatement is material. So in the context of related party transactions, this means that uh, much smaller transactions in the monetary terms may be material as significant a transaction to the users. Okay, so what we are seeing here is that in what we can see here, we are looking at the, the effect of those misstatements is going to have where the, there is no full disclosure of related party transactions, all right? Then you have another one, ISA 580, that looks at written representation. This defines written representation as a written document from the management to the auditor provide, provided to confirm certain matters or to support the other evidence. It is made to convey opinion on some aspect of the account. So what we are saying here is that a recent organization is a document that is prepared by the client management, okay, and given to the auditor. So it's normally requested by the auditor in order to confirm certain matters or to support other audit uh, evidence. So for instance, the auditor requests for the information, let's say about um, 
directors of monument and that information is not provided the auditor the client can present uh a written presentation okay as regards that the reason why they don't want to share that information with the auditor you can use uh, that as a issue a written representation in that regard that what i'm trying to say okay and that will now serve as a source of uh, other audit evidence okay now is five it requires the auditor to obtain appropriate written representation for management okay so this is for him to have some level of comfort all right so in case of future then there are issues we will say that yes i did request for this and this was the response and this is the evidence that they did not give me that information when i requested for it so what are the objectives of written representation the objectives are one to support other audit evidence i've said that okay to fulfill auditor's responsibility in regards to financial statement and audit right then uh, which representation are likely to be uh, to be needed, okay, to support the auditor's understanding of management intention, all right. Also, in respect of completeness of specific item, you might also need the uh, audit. Uh, I mean, written representation, okay. So those are the instances where you make use of what with written representation. Now, written representation about management responsibility. So the auditor, we always ask for that. Like it's a document that also reminds the management of their responsibilities. Are we together? It's a document. So most of the responsibilities of the directors are contained in the written representation as well as the uh, 